Right, I'm strapped in, so I'll just let you two lock horns. Can't wait. We're not going to lock horns. <laughs> never I'm do gonna, lock horns. I'm, we never do lock horns. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. I, I, we're just going to... It's hard sometimes. Because <coughs> what Woz does, he, he sends me a tweet, then he replies to it 30 times before he actually <laughs> reads one of mine. <laughs> And then, then we're like 28 out. <laughs> I'm thinking, he ain't even listening to me. <laughs> then he goes, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, we're good. Yeah, all right, later, mate. <laughs> but those 28 have got to come out. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's very hard on there. <laughs> so funny. He ain't looking. He just replied, bang, bang. Uh, they're, bang, they're, bang. Sa- they're saving the drafts, aren't they? You just automatically, just, you can just hit send. <laughs> then he, then he reads my yeah, then he goes, yeah, all right, uh, that's a good point. <laughs> well, brilliant. It's all therapy, isn't it? It's all therapy. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I don't know if I should carry on and start it from there, just people laughing. <laughs> um, uh, Rick can edit it if he wants. Hello and welcome to Aguna Ramble. My name's James and joining us today we've got regular Clive. Clive, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very, very well. Good Christmas. Yeah, good. I, I went to the game, so I've, I've seen a few things. I've seen a lot of drunk fans. <laughs> yeah, you just sat with Aki, weren't you? <laughs> sat with Aki, like uh, <laughs> seven JDs and a couple of Jager bombs in. Yeah, it's a really good experience, right? So, um, so yeah, let's go from there. Brilliant, and we've also got Woz. Woz, how you doing, mate? Hello, mate. I'm very good, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Um, I, I had the polar opposite experience. Normally, I'm one of them drunk fans in the ground, and I actually weren't there on Boxer Day, and I was sober, so it'd be interesting <laughs> yeah. to see how, how I actually analysed the game sober. It might be very different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we spoke a bit earlier just before we started, and uh, you, you, you said to me, Clive, that don't worry about this one. Um, I was worried for a little bit, <laughs> uh, especially... Um, first half but going going into it you guys uh you know you always say to me clive oh the the uh, hour when the team sheets announced before the game starts is always one of your favorites to log in and have a look at who's baiting who and who's slagging off who i i wasn't too depressed when that team come out you know i thought okay gibbs gibbs i can understand you know monreal has been a bit shaky lately and you know there's a lot of fixture congestion coming up so i could understand that but um the the midfield i thought was a bit you know i was like two two sort of defensive midfielders if you want against west brom at home is it i felt that was a bit negative what about yourself it, it, did, it did the team didn't really surprise me right so Monreal, you know, I, I've got to be honest with you, this whole podcast is going to be, let's put some context around it, right? I'm I'm still not over Man City, right? So, um, and when that Crossville ball went into into Sterling and, and Monreal didn't show him down the line and let him into the box and they scored, it's no surprise that Gibbs started the game, right? So, I don't think there's nothing between them. I don't think either of them can play consecutive games and perform at a, a high level any longer. If, if I'm being brutal, I, I think we can upgrade that position. And um, Gibbs steals ahead for a couple of games, picks up an injury or gets tired. The Monreal comes in. And the way Wenger's rotating them, it's actually working. I think um, I, I would just play Gibbs against some faster opponents, particularly potentially away from home. And I quite like Monreal's combination play and small space passing at home when distances are not so big to cover and we're not running backwards so much. So... If I was Wenger, that's how I I would rotate those two. Given the fact we lost two games, and this will was will agree with me on this one. You know, Wenger can get concerned about losing that third game because third game means crisis. There was no way he wasn't going to go to his favourite home centre midfielder in in Coquelin. and Shaka is really, I think he's now got that spot. Right? And wh- whatever we think is immaterial because. The players have decided he he is the man, and that's why he's got 100 plus passes, and because they give him the ball and he directs the team. So um, so yeah, we can always debate the partner next to um to Shaka. I'm sure we will, and um, and the rest of the team, given the fact that Walker had a calf and Oxlade Chamberlain had a little minor hamstring, 
we could really only only debate with potentially Lucas Perez, but sometimes when you pick a team, you have to think about the bench. You have to think about the last 25 minutes. And if you play all the people that can impact the game from the start, then you've got no option from the bench. And if we were nil-nil, which we were at 70 plus minutes, and we're bringing on Iwobi rather than Perez, then people are going to have complaints, right? So that's a challenge for the coach. I thought the team sort of, um, I was okay with it, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was yourself? I was alarmed, if I'm brutally honest. Uh, yeah. It's for me when I saw the team, I just immediately thought of 15, 16 Arsenal in the second half of the season. Um, six foot four centre forward, two deep line midfielders, inverted wingers. Over reliance on fullbacks against a team that are going to put ten men behind the ball. I thought it was going to be our day's work right from the start, and and I think what influenced Wenger was, as Clive said, and when we've heard this comment a lot of times, if you lose two and you lose a third, it becomes a crisis. And I think Wenger thought, let's pack the middle, let's try and use our fullbacks, but let's not concede anything um, in the, in the middle of the park, and let's let's try and control the game. But it, it was almost as if we was we were scared to be. The expansive attack in Arsenal, we can be, and and again the the over reliance on the fullbacks, and I don't know, I, I was very panicked, and and the fact we had no real impact sub, as in with regards to to retaining the width and and getting wide, and and we got Olivier Giroud there, and starting Alexis, who's a right footed right footed winger on the left, and a Wobi, do you know what I mean, out there, who's, who very rarely, if ever, crosses the ball in, in his entire game. It just it just reeked of a struggle and and first half especially I mean we I mean it don't lie we had one shot on target in the first half and it was it was literally like a training game backs against the wall and we knew they were going to do that but I, I was very alarmed and it was something we saw a lot last season and and it's never ever for me good to have two two deep line midfielders at home and especially with Olivier Giroud who thrives off of runners from from wide areas and from deep and also deliveries into the box, something that we didn't give him any of. And um, I don't know, it was interesting to see the way the game developed, but I must admit, I was, I haven't, recently I've been a little less alarmed at the team because uh, we were a bit more fluid, but with, at home against a team with 10 men behind the ball like that, I just thought, wow, what are we doing? Like, we've, we've, we've had a tough week and we're coming here against a Tony Pulis team and really making it even harder for ourselves. So I really thought we made it as hard as we possibly could. In, instead of stretching the game and getting out early, getting the balls in the box, and letting Giroud do his thing, we we really sort of made it difficult. And the longer the game went on, the, the, the more and more that proved to be true. But yeah, I, was, I, I weren't too happy, but uh, well, I would say that I panicked. I definitely panicked. So I, did, I didn't think it was going to be our day, but there we yeah. are. But what, do you think that... Um, sorry, JJ, I just want... That's all right. I saw the teams, right? I, I saw West Brom's team, and West Brom played Chadley, Phillips, and Rondon, and um, that's probably that's probably their strongest offensive lineup. I mean, we all know it wasn't a very offensive game, but when you saw the two team sheets, you're thinking, okay, then they might actually have a go. They might actually go for that first goal, and they might actually think if we can get the crowd nervous and against Arsenal, then. We got one nil up, and given the fact in the last seven or eight games they've not conceded more than so, sorry, last seven or eight away games, they've not conceded more than one goal. If they score that one goal, they've got a great chance of nicking something. In the end, I thought we controlled the game, pushed them back, and it became exactly what you said was. It became a okay, why have you picked this team? But we had to sort of get that control first. Do you know what I mean? I hear you, I mate. Think- but sorry, mate. Just sorry to put in the only um, the only thing I would say about that is last season. We saw many, many sides play a front three that were quick on the break and Chadley, Phillips and Rondon, all three of them can move. They're not explosive, but they were they were sort of prying, knowing that the fullbacks would be advanced, the wide areas, the wingers were coming in and they just sort of thought, if we hit them, then we're gone. And we saw a lot of teams do that. But, like you said, I thought we were very quick to win the ball back. We were very good in possession, very, very good in possession. We, we, we had a... It was 90% odd um, pass completion rate, which was very high from all the team. And we moved the ball well. So in previous years where we have got caught, and especially the second half of last season with Flamini going walkies, we did have a solid two there. But it's it's a balance that you've got to get right because we lacked a hell of a lot of creativity in the final third, I thought, in the first half. And it was a Mm. a bit more of us being a little bit too respectful and a bit reserved after two results we've had rather than us being 
all right, you do what you want to do, but we're going to rip you apart. And I know it don't always work like that, but I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe it's just the way I saw it. I don't mm. know. It's like it's like you said was when I was when I was watching it. Um, I just remember Shaka just having these pop shots time and time again. I'm like, you're not you're not going to score these in a million years. Like you could take Foster out, uh, Foster Foster out the net, you're still not going to score one. I'm just, I don't know. It just seemed that we tried to drive through, in the, especially in the first half, just drive through the middle, and they were just they they're like they're content with that. All Dow's like, can you give it to Sanchez out? What you know, I know he's an inverted winger, but I'm like, give him give him a chance to spread it and. I think like I've, I've I slagged Kieran Gibbs off a lot. But I think he's been brilliant lately. I'm like give him a chance to get past some people and all that, you know. But I don't know. We just seem to just go straight down the middle and um, Jakob and was it Nyom or whatever that they play in there like CDM. He just was this. He was just reading it all the way through. He thought it was easy. See, I, I thought, you know, I, I looked at that right, and I, I looked at I looked at their team, and they are giants, right? Mm. So they play, they play, they play almost like four centre backs that play really really narrow. Then they play six in midfield. Right? Yeah, they, and that's it. And they're all they're all quite tall. They're all quite, you know, they're all quite angular. And, and and they give you wide areas. They give them to you because then when you cross it, they're gonna win it, right? So I actually for some days like like West Brom, I actually prefer inverted crosses if you know what I mean. Was so like crosses that coming on an angle that you can help on its way. I think they're more threatening, they're more stressful, and I quite like the cross from Alexis right foot into Drew and and Ozil left foot coming inside from where we got the goal from. I think that's the best shape of cross for a tall, defensive, narrow, close distances defensive team like West Brom. So I was I was all right with that. My issue was we didn't do quite enough of it. I quite like the variation at times of going through the middle and then going longer early sometimes and running them and even having the shots straight in. What that does is that means they, that, that pulls people out. So even having the shot, even if it gets you just a new, that makes people think, well, I've got to go and press him next time because he might go and he might actually put one top bags. And once he comes out, they can, they can move into a space behind. So I didn't mind the variation. What was missing for me first half was pace and intensity of what we were doing we were just 10 percent down on speed of thought speed of movement and that got quicker in the second half and i thought we got better from then on mm-hmm. do you think do you think that was nerves though clive or do you think it was just you know there wasn't that create you know like we said there wasn't really that creative spark coming from Xhaka like what the, I mean, the team what was, really relies on i mean it was jt i mean let's be honest right we are i don't want to insult the listener on, on the podcast yeah. right we have seen that game. <laughs> How many times have we have seen that game? Good two we've times. Got, we've all seen that game before, right? And um, and it's not Arsenal's fault. No. You know, there are teams that turn up and just don't play. Don't want to play, have no ambition, have no nothing. Yes, you can question how we break it down. When we've done it in the last five minutes, we can sit back and have a little chuckle to ourselves. There's been a few of those games that we haven't done it over the last three, four years. But we're not the only ones. This is what I call, this is the, you know, the premiership money pressure. I mean, Tony Pulis gets eulogized for his tactical nous. When I actually think uh, that's, that's, that's not for me, to be honest. And, um, and I don't see why he should be held on a pedestal for doing that because anyone can do that, right? So, and his defensive style of football is not for me, but he's added a couple in Chadley and in Phillips and he, he is, beating some of the teams around him and he's the top 10 in the league and he's going to make them another 100 million quid plus if he stays in the league and that's his job but for me that's not top level coaching but the money in the premiership has made those individuals like Pulis like Allardyce he's they've made them gold dust when actually they're, they're not they're not ambitious at all and and we suffer for it and that game yesterday was always 1-0 it was always going to be a horseshoe passing game we had, we had 729 passes. They had 171. Right? Shaka had 141 passes. This isn't a game where you sit back and say, well, isn't that great? 141 passes. Because we all know what those passes, and half of those passes were. They were just continuity passes, right? So, and it's almost not, it's not a game to sort it's, it's an anti game I call it, right? It's just not football, right? But it's football that we're getting used to and we're paying money for and it's um it's indicative of the financial pressures in the premiership. 
Mm. But um, I, even saying that, I do think uh, Forster, for uh, what he's worth, it was one of them, you know, for all the time wasted and everything else. It's like those games when I remember we used to play these like bottom bottom type sides and sides out of the top six, and their goalkeepers would always turn up. I remember like sometimes Tim Krull would look like a prime Buffon and stuff like that. Just, I thought he had a bloody brilliant game, but especially the uh, what was it, the save of his feet from Sanchez, and then the double save from the Awobi shot, uh, and Sanchez again. I thought that was incredible. Yeah, he uses his feet well, doesn't he? Mm. I'm sure watch is still there, but yeah, you know, sorry, when... my army, I'm, I'm just taking it all in. <laughs> <laughs> and when Giroud ran across the face, he cut it back. I mean, that's normally a goal, isn't it? And mm. he, he uses his feet really, really well. And the shot from Sanchez was that was swift, right? And Sanchez has a little trick where people say he hasn't got a, uh, you know, a, a big back lift, but what he does really cleverly, if you watch him and how he generates his power, he hasn't got a quick back lift. But his standing foot is really, really solid. And what he does, he follows through really well. So he follows through the balls. And that's how he generates his power. But by then, it's too late. So short back lift means you're not set as a keeper. And then he's already on you. And, and the power's on its way. And I've been watching how he does it. I think it's really clever, actually. Early shots, quick plant of the, of the standing foot. And then driving through the ball really all the way through. Like a golfer, right? There's always, it's all in the follow through, right? And... Um, and he does it really, really well. So um, he's, he's he's really good to watch. I've got to be honest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was there anything else you guys wanted to touch on with the first half, or is that a bit too? Yeah, the first half sort of um, is saying I really want to forget JJ. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I'd say second half, the first ten minutes, we come out like a house on fire. Do you know what we started doing? Exactly what class that we didn't do enough. We started putting the ball in the box. And if you look at, for me, we we created in a, almost in the first ten minutes, we had four really good opportunities and all four of them opportunities come from us delivering the ball into the box. Alexis hitting the post from a corner, even second balls. We weren't necessarily winning the first balls, but what we were doing and what Olivier Giroud does brilliantly is he causes panic. And it's not just him. If he don't win the first ball, then we're quick to the second ball. And as soon as we started getting them thinking, testing them in the box, we were creating chances at will. And and we were unlucky not to score. And like you said, Foster, I think he, he made some ridiculous saves. Oh, that was one from Giroud where he took it wide on his left. Great strike, save. Tipped one over from Alexis. Um, Awobi had a shot from the edge of the box. He, he palmed away. and we, It just looked like one of them days. But at least we started creating chances in the second half. And it was by being a bit braver, I think. And, and just sort of like Clive touched on, going a bit more direct. I mean, we don't always have to try and pass through teams. And... When when you've got Giroud there, he's the perfect weapon to do that. And and we 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 saw with his goal. I know we'll go into that later. But he can outmuscle any defender in the Premier League when he's up for it. Do you know what I mean? So mm. it, it it was an interesting turnaround. I just felt a lot in the first half. We ate our own space. Um, Alex Awobi done a lot of very good things in the game, but he was doing all them things for me in in the wrong areas. And I, I'm not blaming him personally. I think it's uh, Wenger's tactical approach to the game, he invited him to come inside and, and as a result we've seen Mesut Ozil drop deeper and deeper and, and that's why for me Xhaka's um, he, his most pass combination was to Ozil 34 passes, is over 10 more than any other pairing on the pitch and that was because Mesut was being forced deeper and deeper and deeper and he was starting attacks from deep and, and as a result Ozil created 7 chances in the game which is more than he has in the last 4 that he started up front with Alexis in, in that other almost other system if you know what I mean, with him playing Foot higher up the pitch, closer to Alexis, going on beyond Alexis a lot. And we're used to seeing Mesut create chances at will. And, and he's created seven in the last four, as I said, and he created seven in that one game. But what, um, see, I thought, I thought that's quite smart of Ozil, actually. Because, well, I do too, mate. Yeah, because, the way, because the way that West Brom were playing, they were barricading the spaces, right? And they were literally, stretch your arms out wide, wingspan, don't be bigger than this, like five yards apart. And also, what he did in the first half, when they were a little bit more space, he ran in the channels a couple of times. But in the second half, he thought, actually, my job is to feed the ball into the box. And he just and he didn't, he just came a bit deeper, and he started feeding the ball. And I thought, he let Bellerin go down the left, down the right side, and then cut back to him. Bellerin wasn't going to cross it in a, in, a, in a lateral. As soon as he went wide and he pushed them, they collapsed. Once they collapsed, they bring it back to Ozil, Ozil delivers. On the left-hand side, it's Monreal Gibbs. They push forward. As soon as they go to, go go in behind, West Brom collapse again. They bring it back to Sanchez. Bring it back to more Sanchez and Iwobi, and then we did an inverted cross or a pass across the face. I thought 
that sort of diagonal cross is is the one really. I mean, I just think it took a while to get that as part of our game plan, and maybe and once we did, they weren't that good, were they? In the box, they weren't that defensively aggressive. They weren't that sound. I thought they looked quite panicked, you know, when Santos hit the post. They had about eight chances to clear that, and I thought he just was, like, so good in the box there and deserved a goal. We scored that goal. I've been mean, quite interested to see how the game had gone. Mm-hmm. Um, I just thought, I was, I just think he's such a smart player. He knows, he knows where to be. He knows where his role is for that day. I just think, um, you know, I thought it was a good thing that he came deep. On other days, Actually, I don't agree with it, but I thought you felt the game quite well there. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, like you said, Clive, I would have loved to have uh, got the goal, obviously, for the for the goal difference and everything else. And just to, just for the point of view of that, maybe West Brom then would have had been like, well, do you know what, we, we've got to play a bit now. And if they if they did come out a bit, maybe we could catch them on the uh, counter and score a few more. But obviously, we only got the one, so it was a bit the way it is sometimes, though. But um, what, what, what did you guys make of the... Uh, the, the the subs in the second half, I thought, you know, or, or Gibbs going off injured, I was a bit disappointed at, but Monreal come on, he, did, he didn't look as ropey as he did the week before, which we stated earlier, Clive. Uh, I thought Ramsey, when he come on, he did that, uh, what was it, three-pass little move into the box, and I thought, oh, is, is he going to shank one, and then we're going to, you know, I said it the other week, the minute he scores one, he's he's on, he, we, we're getting him back. And uh, I thought Perez, apart from... Uh, at the end, when he didn't track back, which apparently him and Gabriel had a massive argument about. I don't know if you guys read about that, but um, yeah, apparently. I, Gabriel... read about it. I didn't see it. Did you see no. it? Was I didn't see it. No, I saw. Um, I saw Tim Stillman um, tweet about it, um, suggesting that he had seen the argument, and apparently it carried on into the tunnel. But um, on the on the TV I was watching, they didn't didn't show anything of it. But I did. To be fair, I was looking at Lucas, and I was sort of thinking to myself, he isn't. Um, he isn't playing his reverse gear as much as his um, as his forward yeah. gear. Almost as if he was playing as if he was a centre forward just in a wide area. Which it's the curse of that nine time, mate. Because yeah, he's got, got the Podolski disease. At, at, at one nil up, I mean, we 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 give a lot of our players a lot of stick over the last few weeks for um, for not putting a shift in. And, and by the way, we should applaud as much as we have a go at Mesut, We should applaud him for how hard he was working. I was watching him in them last few minutes, and from what I saw, he was running around like a man possessed wanting to um, see that game out because it's never done and dusted at 1-0. But, um, yeah, I'll, with regards to the subs, JJ, I, I found, I thought, I always want them earlier and we know with Wenger it ain't going to come till the 70th minute. I thought Awobi was um, tiring as it, as physically he does later later on in games and I think we needed a, a fresh approach. I loved the in- introduction of Ramsey as I would and, and not just because it's Aaron Ramsey and everyone likes a lot Aaron Ramsey because it was a progressive midfielder someone who could provide that extra man in the final third that extra run that, that extra bit of panic that unfortunately Coquelin for all his for all his pluses does not offer and he never will he's never scored a goal he never gets in goal scoring positions he never looks to create that's just the player he is he, he's more of a more of a defensive minded midfielder and um, I thought that the you well, like you said, JJ. There was quite a few occasions where he got into them positions and the goal just didn't come. And the one he hit with his left foot at Forster's legs, he started that move from deep. Um, you had even for the goal, he made a run from deep in alongside Giroud for any sniffs and knockdowns. It's just a natural thing to him to to make the move from deep, and it gives defenders something extra to think about because we spent a lot of the first half playing in front of them, and all of a sudden, with Lucas Perez and um, the introduction of Aaron Ramsey, they're two players that are front-footed and, and they like to cause havoc and they like to look like, especially Lucas. It went from Alex Iwobi, who was brilliant on the ball, coming inside, looking to create, looking to move, looking to one-twos, to Lucas Perez, who's thinking, no, I'm on the shoulder now, I'm going to get in. And um, he did put that left foot across, across. I thought it was just too much on it for him, just a bit too far in front. But it was a different proposition and, and a more aggressive attacking type of winger and central midfielder. And as a team, I mean, our chance creation continue to rise in Stoke and, that, and they did not bloody hell not Stoke West Brom continue to tire and it, and it did aim us in the end but I don't know I just I mean when I saw the way Jackie Wilshere played against Chelsea and, and I see Aaron Ramsey and by the way Aaron Ramsey's just coming back from injury so you can't say expect him to start that game and we were a bit short of options it was either Cochrane or El Nenny in there but that's why I worry about Jack's loan because there's been plenty of games where Giroud could do... I mean, you look at one of the best goals we've ever saw, seen at the Emirates, um, Jack Wilshere and Giroud, the, the one-twos. That that don't happen by chance. This is by players bursting, creating options in the final third. 
making, breaking deep line defences by progressive running with their bodies, not just what they do with the ball. And sometimes I feel that we could do with that, especially at home, especially when we're not quite getting wide, especially when Giroud's isolated. It just called for something like that. And, and we've waited a long time for the subs. And when they did come on, they did make an impact. So you got to applaud Arsenal for that. And especially with no Ox and Theo, we didn't really have an explosive player on the bench. But what he did do is give us a different type of player from in both in the middle of the park and sort of on that wing. And um, Alexis was sort of allowed to roam freely after the sub from what, what I thought really. But we did, we did get the goal in the end. So you've got to applaud the subs, haven't you? Mm-hmm. And Clive? Yeah, I thought um, I thought Perez. He, he's a he's a interesting player. So he's like a, a a wide forward. But what I like about him is how he searches for work. He he tracks the ball, and he stays. He's not stupid, right? He stays close to Urza and Sanchez. When they move, he keeps five yards away from them, and he's quite a combining footballer. So um, and so I mean, he put a cross in on the left. And he's actually brought on to play on the right. Right, so he tracked it across, did that a couple of times, and his movement is quite wise in in one direction. But then, of course, it gives him a long way to run back. After we scored the goal, I'll tell you now, boys, there was a there was a we had five people up, and no one in the middle of midfield apart from Shaka, and we had Ramsey and Lucas ahead of the ball. We won the lap with a minute to go, trying to score a goal, and the players were not happy. They were not happy. Monreal was very angry and he stormed down a the tunnel. There was, there was a bit of angst amongst the players about how we reacted after the goal. And I think it's great when we have all these runners and we all know what Arsenal's right. We score a goal, we all get excited like kids, right? We go running forward looking for the second. But we got caught in Monaco a few years ago. Remember, we've been caught before. And, um, and I think sometimes, I mean, they broke on us. Literally, it was, it was four on four. And you're thinking, what are we doing? We just spent 86 minutes trying to get a goal, and then and they're broke on us. And um, I think I agree with us. Right? Obviously, when we're playing and we're trying to break a deep line defence, Ramsey comes on 20 minutes ago. You know what he's going to do? He's going to move the ball as quick as he can, and he's going to he's going to sniff. He's going to sniff to get in the box, and uh, that's what. At that time, we can afford it, so it's not an issue. Um, Perez did okay. And Monreal, he looked quite determined. Whether he was angry, he stormed down the tunnel at the end of the game. Whether he was angry because he wasn't picked, whether he was angry because of our tracking back left him exposed late in the game, I don't know what it was, but there was definitely some angst and some, we wanted to win that. You know, real anger and aggression when the whistle went. And it's something that you'd, I, I wouldn't normally notice when I, and I, I'm a, I'm a direct debit guy, I go once a month, right? And, um, but when I go, I, I can, I do the things I look for and, um, that was a well-needed win, for sure. And I think um, the subs played their part in that. Mm, and you touched on the goal there. Uh, what, what, a nice, what a nice goal it was. I mean, uh, if, it, if it didn't go in, it was, uh, I was hoping and praying. It's definitely a penalty. It's like the guy's all over him. Oh, I, I, sorry, Clive. I was talk, talking with mute on no, then, mate. You go. <laughs> no, you go, you go. Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head with the, the area of delivery, Clive. Um, stressing the centre-backs, but... What, what 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 I would say about Olivier Giroud is the strength of the man. I mean, he's got a big bouldering centre back, almost piggybacking him to win that header, and not just win the header, get enough on the header to loop over the keeper from from a, quite a distance. I mean, it weren't that far out, but the way the angle of the cross, he's got to use his neck to head that in the net. He's, there's not a great deal of power going onto it. He's not just flicked it on and direct. He's proper directing that, and Giroud is probably the only player in our whole team who could do that. And it's it's nice to see him get some bloody service for once. I mean, it's so painful watching it. Like you just, I feel so sorry for Giroud. We ask him to run channels and and create space and make movements, and he, he just wants a ball on his big bloody French head. Like and he, the header, and and you could see when we scored that the relief amongst the team. I mean, I don't know if you've seen it back, Clive. When when Giroud scored, he runs over slides and knees. Alexis comes over and boots him up the bum. And, uh, it, it, oh, it's cracking me up watching that. And it, it was almost as if to say, yeah, it's not, it's not me who's got it today, but fucking, I love that, Ollie. I love that. And, um, it was, it, and it was the intelligence, like you said, of Bellerin getting down the right and Ozil's intelligence again to get into them areas that really you wouldn't be seeing him in. And he's dropped deeper and realized that Bellerin's gone and we've got no right winger out there. So he's took it upon himself to get in that position. 
and like you said, the, the, the centre backs are set for a cross from Bellerin, gets it back, and then all of a sudden the whole angle's changed. And when it's crossed in, Giroud gets in front of his man and and bullies him, absolutely bullies him. And we got to give Giroud a lot of credit. I mean, he scored he scored a, a large, a large amount of goals in his time at Arsenal for for really a player that has. I wouldn't say has been given the correct service since day one. Realistically, for for a man of of his abilities and talents, what he offers, I don't think we ever really play to his strengths. But when you've got situations like that, and we said earlier on in the season, I alluded to um, someone like Eddie Zeko at City. When there's games that, that aren't going right, they would they would be the men that would that get the goal, and that's just something out of nothing—a wonder delivery and a phenomenal header and a great bit of strength and. In the end, that saved our blushes from from something similar in the Middlesbrough game. And, and don't forget, earlier on in the season, Giroud come on at home against Southampton. The 2-1 won the penalty with a similar thing. Just the ball through to him, the big strength. You could question whether it was a penalty or not, but it, it's a similar thing. He's got the right side of his centre-back and, and he causes the damage. And I just wish we would use him better and more often rather than expecting him to, to put away every chance he gets. But... I mean, it was a great goal, and, and 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 in the end, after the week we've had, it was massive in terms of seeing this season not fall on its fall on its heels because we had, it's a long way back from um, eleven points behind. I mean, nine points is three games, four games is massive, and we've got to just keep plugging away and keep winning our games. But that was huge, and I'm, I'm sure you erupted in the ground, Clive, and it was probably more of a sense of relief, judging from past experiences, than um, than really elation. Yeah, I mean that goal. I mean, I'm, it, it, that was a very, very good header, right? So he's he's ragged all his centre half and he's he's pinned him down, and he's while he's battling for it, he's positioning his body to then arc it over the goalkeeper. I mean, that is that is top class. I, I thought I, I thought Drew wasn't as dominant as he can be. I also thought we didn't play too much as we could have done, but on occasion he won the ball. And he's gone out, won some dominant headers, and we haven't read them. I just don't think we were saying we weren't as programmed to run off, you know, to run off his flicks. And um, and then there were times when the centre backs, and you know, Johnny Evans is a smart player, right? And he stepped in front a few times, and um, Drew got involved in body checking and blocking people off. I think they read him quite well, and and it's it's no it's no coincidence, it was that when late in the games. When teams are closer to their goals, when they're more tired, that's when he's scoring goals. I mean, that was his first Premiership start versus West Brom, but he scored late on. And that's when teams are nearer their goal, when he's in the box. And when he's in the box, all they're doing to him outside of the box, they can't do to him inside the box. And suddenly, he's physically in charge. And when he holds somebody, they, they can't react. They can't push him back because he may go down. And if he goes down, it's a penalty, right? So, um, so I think the closer we get him to the goal, the better he is. I mean, it sounds very obvious, but suddenly he's in charge of the jewels, and and that goal he's done that a few times, isn't he? In the box, he is the man. We've got to get him closer to the goal quicker, and sometimes that just needs us to be a bit more aggressive and maybe do some balls down the side to force teams back. West Brom were well organised, right? And um, they kept us out of their box until late on. And when late on, once we were in their box, they were they were shaking and we got the goal. But fair play to him. But he wasn't as dominant as I expected. And I, I, I have to say something to you now, right? There was periods in that game when Sanchez was out on the left wing. And I'm looking at, in, well, in my mind, is our talisman and our player who's our game breaker. We can debate if he's our best player. But I don't think it's right having him play wide left you know, with, with defensive responsibilities. Now, there wasn't much yesterday, so he was able to be free, especially after substitutions. But there were long periods, and I was saying to her, Kill, this doesn't look right. It's not right that our best player has to wait for us to cycle the ball to him. He needs to be more central. He needs to be causing more problems there. And, and we were talking earlier today was about formations and things like that. That's what that was, that was what in my mind. Watching... You know, I went to a Chelsea game and Chelsea's season changed when they stopped having Eason Hazard track fullbacks. Bellerin embarrassed him in front of the whole nation. Eason Hazard's not tracking fullbacks no more. He's now playing like a number nine or, or one of two number tens behind the centre forward and he's got people behind him to do his job. And now his job is all forward facing. 
I'm not saying Sanchez was running to the corner flag. We know what he's like. If, if you an opportunity to defend, he will do it because he will not let allow people to run over his past his shoulder. I just think um, we've got to find a way to get our two superstars really central, really effective, really close with less defensive responsibility. And um, hey, it didn't cost us nothing yesterday, but it's something I just looked at. It's not for West Brom. West Brom was a non game, right? But we got, we got um, Chelsea on February the 4th, and I'm thinking ahead to that game. And I'm looking at our last 20 games versus top six away, where we've drawn seven and lost 14, have seven from 63 points. I'm thinking to myself, hold on a minute. Are we going to do this? Or what are we going to do different to win these games? Right. Oh, sorry, go on. Go on, mate, no. no I, I just, I've yeah, got right. a devil's advocate, mate. I mean, I'm mean, i not saying I disagree with you at all there. I understand exactly where you're coming from. It's just a little devil's advocate. We've seen Alex Awobi basically given the freedom of the park on the left wing this season. And yeah. uh, he's not he's not been asked to defend, and he hasn't defended, and Monreal's been exposed as a result. Now, what? The, I, in my opinion, the reason we've been allowed to do that is because Theo Walcott has been hugging the touchline on the right. And yep. we, we, we've retained the width on one side, allowed our left winger to come in and, and play a huge part of the game. Our number 10 is then pushing beyond our number 9, and we've got a good sort of system going there. Now, my question to you is, that the situations that we're seeing Alex away we pick the ball up in, wouldn't you love to see Alexis get in that space and, and being able to drive from that inside left position and, and seeing a lot more of the ball? I mean, why we see so much possession and Walcott sees it next to nothing. But people always say, oh, he's not in the game, he's not in the game. But what he is doing is allowing the other, from, from the way I'm seeing the perspective of, of that, that formation, what Walcott's retention of width is doing is allowing Alex Awobi to come in and affect the game more centrally. And Oxley chamberlain we saw him do it at West Ham, continuously driving through the middle of the park. And, and you look what Ox done on that side, and that's probably more comparable because he's as explosive as Alexis. Alexis loves getting the ball and running at people. And if he gets the ball in that inside left area and he's got Giroud to play off of and, and you've got the retention of width on the other side, do you think it could work? I'm not, I'm not saying that is 100% going to work, but what I'm trying to give devil's advocate of, we're not asking him to run up and down because Awobi hasn't done that this season and Ox hasn't done that this season, but the balance of the team has almost allowed us to do that with Xhaka on the, on the left side of the deep, deep midfield. Yeah. And uh, just... It would be interesting for me if Giroud does start and we have got a situation where Alexis has to play on the left, what the retention of width by Theo Walcott on the other side would give us and if you personally think that if he was in a Wobie's position has been this season, how how more effective could we have been as a team and how effective could Alexis be in that area? The, the way I see it was, I, a Wobie is... It's not his fault, but I'm talking big games now. Right? I'm not talking West Brom at home, right? Where they're where they're they're not even trying to win. I'm talking Chelsea away, right? So I'm talking Liverpool away. I'm talking uh, those bigger, bigger games, right? So what well, Tottenham away? My my view is we we need to have a four three three type system, right? With three centre mids in, and the way we use Özil in big games is we lose him as a third midfielder. Call him a 10, whatever you like. He has two behind him. So he, that means in big games, he's got defensive responsibility. In big games, when he hasn't got the ball, when we haven't got as much as the ball, that puts him at risk of going missing. Right? So I think we need to have a third centre midfielder. And I, I, that centre midfielder, his attributes need to be what I call a connector. Right? So we have what I call connector centre mids. Well, we have one up, we got one at Bournemouth. We got one that's injured in Sandy. We've got one in Ramsey, who are old, we disagree, but I think he's a third midfielder, if you see what I mean, rather than a second midfielder. And we've got one potentially in Oxley Chamber, who's a connector in a different way, who connects with a, with a run, like he did at West Ham. So we need a connector. So we need three in, rather than having two in with one free, one free on the left, one non-touch player on the right, and our centre forward doing three men's jobs. Right? So... We need to be more competitive. We need to be more pragmatic, having three in. And we spoke earlier today about how Germany used us, all right? And this is, um, and what I was trying to say was, was what Germany do against the San Marinos, Ozil's free and they have two behind him, all right? He can do what he likes. It doesn't really matter. It's San Marino, right? It's just, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. But when they're playing the top teams, he's in, he's in part of the front three and he normally plays on the right hand side. He's not expected to, go to the corner flag and cross it. But he creates from there and he goes 
out to him. And he does that in very cross. What he does on most of his assists on the right hand side. And what they're saying is, is it a big game? We don't, we want to make sure we, we, we're in it. We want to give you, we want you in the areas of the pitch where you are strong. You are ice cold in the last third. Your technique is solid. It never drops. You can play the same pass no matter what the temperature of the game is. And what they're saying to him, we're going to give you the ball and you clean it up and you send it out the other way nice and tidy, nice and neat. He did it in the World Cup final. They didn't play him in the 10. They played him slightly wider. I think he's a great number 10. But number 10 football, he's dying. Right? Who plays number 10 football anymore? Not very, not very many teams. What they do is they play, they play three up and they say, go and, you go and get the game. You go and win the game. We'll provide the platform. Then suddenly was the third midfielder has a bit more license because he's a connector. He's the one that feels the game. On days when the game's going against us, he drops in, provides a platform. On days we need to go and get the game, he breaks forward, knowing we have the insurance. If our fullbacks go high, then our two dropped in, they go wide to cover, and the fullbacks do what are called recovery runs. They invert inwards, and they don't take the midfielder's place, right? So, it, it, for me... Seven out of 63 points away games versus the top six teams. We've got to look at how we've been set up, right? The last time we won at City, which was two years ago in January, funny enough, Ozil didn't play. We had no number 10. We went 4-1-4-1. We had one in front and we had two connectors in Santi and Ramsey. They ran their backsides off. We had Oxlade Chamberlain one side. I can't remember who played left. And we won the game. Our Santos played left and Drew was up front. And that's how we won the game. We had connection. We had three centre mids, no number 10. Do you see what I mean? Which made us competitive, which means we could get out of the press, we could travel up the pitch. And we have to think back to that. We have to think back to, okay, we're now managing risk. We're now, we are too open. We have two, we have a Wobi who's young, who's building. There are plenty of teams in the Premiership that bottom 10 just want to survive where he can learn his trade. We've got Theo, who's not a big touch player. He's a dynamic player, but he can go through some games of 15 touches. Can we afford to have that versus the biggest team? I'm not so sure, right? We need 11 players who are going to contribute, going to contribute defensively, but also we need the ability to connect with our superstars. What the team lacks, in my opinion, is a, a Danny Welbeck-type centre-forward who can be a target, but also take you down the sides. And what that does, as you well know, was it stretches the game out, creates more space in behind, offers that threat of pace, which means you can't step up against them. And then, of course, once you've got teams pushed back, Giroud's the king, right? So so that's how I see, you know, if I'm picking a team for European Cup final tomorrow or Chelsea on February the 4th, we have to add that third midfielder, make Ozil the third forward. And still give him the freedom with, so we're not coating him off like we were against Everton for not defending. We're not coating him off like we were against Man City for not running about. We have to allow people to do their, to be strong in their, at their primary jobs. And that's all Chelsea have done. They've removed Ivanovic because he was a weak link at fullback. Aspen Aquera at left back was never going to last for too much longer without John Terry next to him. They've moved him into right side defensive position where he doesn't have to do any going forward at all, just got to go one-on-one duels. They've got Cahill playing left, but now he's got the comfort of David Luiz, who suddenly looks like Franz Beckenbauer in centre of defence. And they've just moved the front three forward and said, you go and win us again. You don't come back here. We'll give you the ball as early as we can. And then we're going to support you with strong running wide men. But what they've done is they've put their primary match winners in positions of strength to win the game. They haven't put onus on them to save games defensively. And I think we have to do that and get our stars higher up the pitch with less defensive responsibility. But also for our centre mids, and this suits your boy Ramsey, by the way, because then he can be part of a three. He can work, he can control, he can move, he can break, and no one's killing him if he doesn't get back. Do you see what I mean? But he's causing people problems and he is the master at forcing people backwards with pure power and effort. And so I just think we need to change how we play in these big games. And watching, what, what I took away from yesterday's game, watching it live, and watching Sanchez on his haunches on left-hand touchline, 
waiting for the ball. I'm thinking, this isn't, this isn't right, you know? So I'm almost, what I'm saying there is almost having as two number 10s behind the centre forward, just three up and let the three rotate, let them move, let them devastate, but three up and we say to teams, this is where we're playing. We're playing here in this part of the pitch, unlike versus City when we played outside of our box once we scored. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes complete sense, mate. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll let JJ, right? <laughs> no, no, like, I'm, just, no. I'm just processing it in. I just don't think he'd... Uh... I, don't, I just think it's a uh, way of trust, and I don't think he trusts Ozil. Not necess- he's not necessarily out wide, right, like you said, Clive. I don't think he can trust Ozil to do it. But um, I remember what uh, you saying about years ago about Oxlade in the centre. And uh, I remember reading an article by Robert Pires where he said that um, he watched, I think it was a reserve game or something, and Oxlade Chamberlain played centre mid for a bit, and then he played up front or something. Yeah, against yeah. someone and he said he said like I don't know why they don't do it in the main team because he said he just he just knocking people off the ball here he's dictating play he's bossing things around so you know I don't know why we don't give him more of a try but I no I, mean, I, I think the system like you said it can be tweaked like you know to suit the to suit the game that you're in really I call that third midfielder I call it the connector position mm. I call it, I talk to Tim Stillman on online I call it like almost like a Ray Parler position so there's different ways to connect you can dribble out like santi does and he's a genius right and we all know what he can do you can run out drive out without the ball like ramsey does he passes it and he goes he follows it he follows the ball he follows his pass he breaks what that does that makes people follow him so you drive people back or you can just drive out with the ball like oxlade chamber did at west ham and he and he travels with it and that threat of his speed and beating the first man a dribble immediately sends everyone running backwards. And once you've got people running backwards, you're in. So that third position is like a connector. And it's really key. And, and that's what, we, but what we're doing with that third position right now. We're giving it, we're giving it to Meza Ozil. We're saying we're picking you as a 10. And then what he does, he, he vacates it because he goes where he feels the game. Then we've got a Wobi left who's just trying to do a job in front of the left back. Uh, which doesn't make sense to me. And then we've got Theo on the right-hand side, who's dependent on service and dependent on timing of run, dependent on being you know, included in the game plan. If we haven't got the ball, he's inefficient. So first things first, control the football. We need three centre mids in. Control the football. Change the percentage of possession in big games. Once we do that, then suddenly we start to feed the ball in. So our centre mids are as good as their options. But if you're saying to me as a centre mid, I've got Ozil and I've got Sanchez, you can find them in you can find them anywhere. You can find them at midnight, can't you? You can find them with mm. no floodlights on. They're always available. Once they get it at feet, they're buying a foul or they're moving off the spot or they're combining. That takes the emphasis into areas of the pitch that we want it to be. We have to do something. We have to do something. We cannot continue to throw away leagues year after year after year. Because when we go away to a top 16, we do not win. We do not win. Mm-hmm. Seven points out of 63. That, that is, I don't know, we all love the team, right? But that is staring us in the face. We have not won in 20 games. So that tells me something's not right at the balance of our side. Mm-hmm. I think you make a good point as well about uh, Danny coming back, though, because I feel that if he decides to go with that Sanchez up top system as well, I'd like to see maybe if Iwobi does drop out, if he can play. If, I'd like to see Theo, Danny, and Sanchez just to see what them three can do. I think that'd be quite a good because obviously he's got the work rate to help. Like you said, Monreal, if it goes a bit wrong, he, he you know Danny Welbeck will run back. That's the, one of the main qualities about him. Mm. Oh, Clive, I must. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you put forward four three three, and it's on my Christmas list for next year. But you, you and I both know that that will not happen. Under- it's not happening. It's not happening. It will not happen under Arsene Wenger, mate. And like you said, 7 out of 63 points, mate. The, the, the long and short of it is, the only constant throughout that has been the manager. And that is a painful thing. We've had different players, different squads. The only constant has been Arsene. And, and until we... Re- oh, I mean, I looked at the City game and, and it disappointed me as much as it disappointed everyone else. But I just thought the lack of... Lack of balls shown. The lack of meat. The lack of... The will to win. Do you know what I mean? I, I thought this ain't Arsenal. This ain't the Arsenal thing I know and love. We was five yards in front of our own box. And the only thing 
that, well, that whole four three three thing you said that I will disagree with is uh, about Theo being pointless because in every big game, he is the man who comes up with the goods. That although he doesn't touch the ball very often, he often is the the one man that breaks the lines and and does get the goal or get the assist and get the key moment. But do you know what the the, the most frustrating thing without listening to you, you talk about the four three three and the three midfielders and 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 Jacker will be in there. And uh, oh, Matt, could you imagine Jacker Wiltshire Ramsey as a three? I mean, just uh, it frustrates me that we allowed Jack to go and 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 the, the players we've got. I don't know. I just the, the painful thing is we're not going to see four three three. I don't think. And and as much as it's a, a very good option, I just think if he's going to stick to four two three one, I think he needs to to utilise it better and, and and get the best out of the out of the players we've got. But I don't know. We're, we're we're sort of on that seesaw again. I always mention and and it, it's the seesaw time of the season. It's the middle of the season. We're still in the FA Cup. Still in the Champions League. Yeah, we're nine points behind, but. This is where Arson comes into January. Does he kick on? Does he get an additional wide forward? Does he does he go for broke? Does he get it right for once? Or are we going to see a similar pattern where second half of the season he panics and um, we drop out of contention and we go on a good run and end up in the top four and and second or third or and just miss out on a title to to Chelsea and then say oh yeah unlucky unlucky but I don't know it's just frustrating and it's, it's a recurring cycle and we're not seeing. We've seen so many other managers, Conte. I mean, Conte's come in. He's analysed his squad for two, three months. He's changed the formation completely. He's won 12 games in a row. Arsene Wenger, in the last 12 years, has barely changed the formation at all. And and, and that's where, I don't know, I, love, I mean, I love Arsene. And long, long term, we all love Arsene and his statue and all that. It's another day talking about where we should go or not. But I just want to see him react with the growing game of football and like you said some formations and certain positions have not becoming extinct but they're becoming less less used and less often and, and they're finding other ways to get the best out of these better players and the only question I'd ask is really are, are we going to see that under our current manager and, and really are we going to get the best out of players like Ozil and Sanchez on a, on a regular basis and, and are we going to win titles again and there's so many big questions for this stage of the season but unfortunately we've been here before and 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 they followed the same path for many seasons, probably on three or four occasions at Christmas, at least in the last sort of twelve years. We've been in a position where we could have kicked on and won the league, and and it's never materialised. So, fingers crossed, he starts starts getting everything right, and, and we get kicking again. Because it, for a few weeks and, and a month or two, it looked like we had something really good going on, but we then got come unstuck, and teams got a bit wise to it, and, and we've had to change again. And now Giroud's back, and. We've got Welbeck coming in and we're going to have to find ways of fitting his players in. Ramsey back to full fitness. I don't know. It's just like we said at the start of the season, do we trust Arson to utilise what we've got and rotate sufficiently to to propel us onto the levels? I don't know, but we'll see. We'll see. I think the not just point me was about um, City. It was in previous years. You know, we, you know, Chelsea 6-0, the rest of it, the thousands game. I felt they were better than us. I felt they were more rounded, their squads were deeper, they were more mature, they were older than us. We were always evolving. But there, no one can tell me that that Man City side that we played against was confident, they were better than us. Absolutely no way. We, we, sh- we shut their crowd up. We did not sense our moment. And that tells me, that I, that's, that says to me, how much do we believe about how good we actually are? And because we had them cold, right? And then we made to find a way to lose. So now I'm questioning. What you do with a question of manager, in my opinion, you ask yourself, could someone else get more out of the group of players that we have? And that was a day when people say he's not doing what he could do. That was a day where it's very difficult to argue against that. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's no one can tell me that their central defenders on their defence that they have versus what we have is better. Yaya Torres had a he's had a dead cat bounce, but that ain't gonna last too long before he he, he cops it. But are you telling me that we couldn't pick the right players in our squad to push them back and to win that game or be more aggressive and get the second goal and finish them off? We just didn't do it, we didn't treat the game with respect, it was even worse at Everton. And now we're in recovery mode, right? So we're now in points accumulation mode. But what's happened now is we all expect to win the next four or five games. Everyone says, let's win the next four or five, then we've got Chelsea. That means expectations are really, really high. 
And so if we don't win those next four or five games, you know, the, the question is going to be asked all over, all over again. So we have to win them to stay in contact and then, and then go from there. So, um, I'm just so disappointed that we did on that week, on the 18th week, that we lost both games in the manner that we did. And, um, I think it's, uh, something I've not recovered from yet. And it's going to take me till Chelsea before I'm recovered from it. It was Man United esque, Clive, wasn't it? It was Old Trafford esque, some of them performances. Yeah. Not, not, not... As, not as dismal and disappointing, but in, in the way that we approached the game with regards to it being there for the taking against the side that, I mean, Everton haven't won in eight or whatever it was. City looking struggling with poor centre backs, aging full backs, Yaya Torre, like you said. I mean, it's just, it's just frustrating that both games happened in the same week and in the manner that both games happened. And we've got to brush ourselves off from it and we've got to look forward because we have to. But to go from being one game from the top of the league to nine points behind is, is heartbreaking in a week, really. And it was massive to get that goal. Absolutely massive. And we just got to keep keep pushing on and like you said we have to win these games now we put ourselves in a position where we have to so fingers crossed we do mm, um, I, I'll just ask you guys something quick you know for me when, I, when I'm watching Arsenal now it, it gets to a stage where I'm like when we go 1-0 up I, I always think to myself like we've got to get two or three here because we, we could balls it and I don't feel that way when I watch any other top team from another league I don't really think you know the other the other night when I was watching Chelsea, I'm like, well, when they score one, it's just it's just routine. They're just going to keep going and going. And I, I don't know why with Arsenal, I always feel we need to, we need to get two here or we need to get three here. It's just that, that, that's one of the most frustrating things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's come from years past, Clive. I don't I don't know if you. I think it's just the trust of seeing what we've seen for the last twelve years. And I think until we do get over the line as a team, I think everyone will still have that same feeling. I don't know what you think about that, Clive. Yeah, I said it last week. Like, we all, we've all got scars, right? <laughs> we've all got scars. I've not recovered from the uh, the Tottenham four four or the Newcastle four four. These scars are deep, right? So um, I think um, I think it's just one of those, mate. It's just being a fan. Other teams we don't care enough about, so um, they just go and do their thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you, you're spot on, Nick. I, I, I remember games like. Going up to Wigan, being two 0 up and and conceding three goals and away at Wigan, you just things like that. You just don't seem to trust it as a football fan. It's a natural reaction, but once you get winning games, it, it you you feel like you can continue winning games, and that's what we've got to get back because we had a point in the season where it did, we were winning games on the trot consecutively, and I've even said on the pod, I, I felt comfortable. Well, I actually felt for the first time in a long time that do you know what? If it don't happen early, it's going to happen, but. Now, all of a sudden, the past week and two results and then the 84 minutes we waited, it just seemed it stunk of, of, of a lot of lot of performances we saw last season with a Swansea result, the nil-nil against Southampton. And that's where it really imploded at home last season. And I felt like it really was going to be that. But we got the goal and that's the main thing. And we've had a few like that. The Burnley game, the, the Southampton at home, the late penalty. We got the goal. So... Let's, let's there is a bit of determination there, was there really is. There is, mate, um, there is. There is. It's different. I will anger. say that it's different in there. There's an anger there. I, I see that amongst the players. There's an anger. There's determination. They're letting each other have it. This isn't like um, the old crest days, right? They're, they are they are serious about it, which means I just wish they would believe in a little bit more. Or, or since they, they, I have to say, the, the game plan for these games at Everton and City was wrong. It's as simple as that. And the game plan was wrong. They were both teams were scared of us. We and we didn't we didn't take advantage of it, right? So um, that tells me the messages have been sent through and what to do at one 0 were not the right messages. So look, it's it's just two games, right? And we've lost we've lost two in twenty. So, but it is the manner. And you know, if we just won one of them, lost one, I would be I'd be fine. But two the way we did, it, it really bothered me. Yesterday, I'm, I've moved on from it already. I'm already thinking about Palace and Bournemouth and 48 hours in between because that's going to be hard. And what's he, what's he going to do to rotate that? It seems really unfair to me, those short space through those two games, but it is what it is. But can Arsenal recover and go away to a sprightly Bournemouth in the second game and, um, and, and do the business? And we'll soon find out. Mm-hmm. Are, you, are you worried about the Palace game at all? You know, new manager in there? Well, it's Big Sam, isn't it? It's, it's mm. our mate, Big Sam, who... Who, for years at Bolton, even with some of our better sides, he knew what to do and he knows how to push the buttons and we've got to find a way of doing it and we're going to see a similar thing. But the one thing I would say about Palace 
If we don't get it right, Wilfred Zaha is in good form and they've got dangerous players, Jason Punch and Zaha, Benteke. They're not they're no mugs. They they really yeah. aren't. And I think they've um Pardew's been under underperforming there and with Big Sam in there, he, he's gonna have a steady base and and he he might try and hit us on the counter and I think uh, we, as much as it sounds like a cliche of the early goal is so vital in that game and mm. we can't panic but I just feel I'll feel a bit worried if we have a reliance on our fullbacks, especially with um, Zaha and Andros Townsend, because they will spring. They will have a solid base and they will spring. And we've got to be very careful because we've seen them type of games a hundred times before, and and really West Brom didn't offer much on the counter, but we've seen a lot of sides do exactly that. And mm. I don't know. I just I just I just hope we we see it through. And 2017 ain't ain't the worst start to the year we've ever had. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Happy New Year! No, I, I, I mean I can see down. a lot of people. A lot of people that are, are on my timeline and everything else. They're sort of saying it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to win all these games before Chelsea anyway, and then it's probably Chelsea we're going to lose. But I don't know. For some reason, I feel like you said Palace with Allardyce as well. I feel they're just going to sit deep, pump that ball like most of his teams did, and then like you've said with uh, Zaha and Townsend and Benteke, if they win from set pieces, you know, could buy a whip and a mid and then they've got some big boys, isn't they? They got the um they got Tompkins, they got uh is it Joe, is it Ward or whatever at right back, he's a big person in the box. I just worry about them set plays. I mean, especially after yesterday with the uh I mean that Jakob, if he was more awake, they'd have gone one nil up and we'd have been right in the shit because Sheck dropped that ball completely. All of them sort of turned around and like bugger. They'd sort of looked at it as how how did he miss? Yeah, it was a foul, JJ. Hmm. The referee walked up to check afterwards and said a little word of him and check gave him a little thumbs up. And, yeah. Um, he's like to say, yeah, you got fouled. If it had gone in, I would have blown it. Oh, oh fair enough. Oh, I thought it was a, <laughs> I was a bigger... <laughs> I was just, we uh, dropped a clanger. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Palace, Palace are Palace, right? But they, they don't travel well. I mean, Big Sam, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm, I'm not a fan of... Um, <laughs> I'm just really not a fan of these of these so-called English jewels in the crown. These old boys network that they're off for two months. They go to Dubai for two months. They come back. They go on goals on Sunday, and they get an interview with Jeff Shrees, and they're back in the job, right? And I'm thinking, you know, we're not seeing enough young progressive coaches get these jobs. It's the same old geezers going round and round and round and round. I mean, Big Sam. I don't know how many clubs in Premiership he's actually managed. I think, but he's got the record, right? So. And I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's progressive for our game. Um, I'm not unhappy he's out in the English, out the England job. And, um, I'm hoping Southgate does a better job. But um, we will need to get more newer, younger managers getting on this merry-go-round and not the same old cultures going around like Pulis and Allardyce, right? Just to make sure that foreign investors get their money in their pockets. But that's where, that's where we are. And I think we'll take them. I think we'll take them easy. I'm more worried about Bournemouth. I'm more, about, I'm more worried about the recovery of 48 hours and going away. You know, and what we do away, given, given our last two away results. I mean, uh, Palace have got a great front six on paper, but um, their record this year in 2016 is one of the worst, if not the worst in the league. So um, on paper means nothing. Sam will get, the, will get a bounce, but it won't last too long. No, no. Okay, guys, well, uh, I'll wrap it up there. So I want to say thanks, Clive. Sorry, mate. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, um, I'm sorry for my little for my little system, man. I'm not sorry. So I'll see how it sounds, right? <laughs> okay. I'm sure people are gonna let me know. And um, that's great, yeah. great as always, Clive. Don't worry. No, nah, mate. I just want. I've got. We got to do something, haven't we? We got to do something. You know, we're we're not idiots here. We're not. We're fans. We're not. We're not mugs. We can't continue this going on. We got to do something. Even how we play, or we got to change something. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and I want to say thank you, Warren, as well. Uh, thank you very much, JJ, and I'd like to wish you two personally and everyone on the Ramble a, a very Merry Christmas, and obviously everyone who listens a very Merry Christmas, and obviously I won't be speaking to you for the new year, but hopefully um, next time I do, we, we come away with six points from um, from them two games, and everyone has a great great New Year's Eve and, and a great New Year. So cheers for having us on, JJ. No way. Thank you, guys. You, you've done it for me. I was going to wish everyone a happy new year myself, but <laughs> you've, 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 done it, you've done it even better. You've done my hosting job for me, which I can't complain at. So I'll say that all the way to the bank. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave us a comment. Leave us a thumbs up if you can. We really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we, we got back on the older audio format this time, but I know, uh, Clive, you guys are back in the new year, aren't you, with another video pod. So. 
Yeah, I think so. I better get my face my facelift done, but yeah, I think we're going to be <laughs> Dust off them uh, ciders a bit quicker as well. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thanks again, everybody, and take care.